what we tend to see in the United States, at least over the last 60 years, is that the major gun control bills that have passed at the federal level, the, the ones that add a significant amount of new restrictions on who can own guns and how you can uh, buy them, sell them. Those have tended to come after political assassinations or assassination attempts, right? Um, we can look at the, the Gun Control Act, 1968, and the Brady Act uh, was 1992, if I remember correctly. Or 93, correctly. I 93. think it was, yeah. yeah. Um, as your prime examples of this. And so, you know, we're, we're still in the immediate aftermath here. But that, that's where my mind goes to on, on this front um, as far as gun policy is concerned with this and, and perhaps gun politics as well. Uh, we also just had the RNC, and I think we'll get into some of that and how it relates to this uh, in a little bit. But just give me your thoughts on, um, you know, what, what are you seeing right now in the immediate aftermath? One week out, do you see any change in gun, our gun politics or the future of gun policy today? You know, it's interesting because in the the week or so since this has, you know, been one of the primary topics. And, you know, I mean, you talk about all of the unprecedented news. It's amazing that a, an attempt on Donald Trump's life is just one of the big stories that we've been covering this week. Right. Um, and I think that maybe one of the reasons why the push for gun control has been somewhat muted. Um, because this has not occupied 100 percent of our attention. Right. We've had the RNC going on. You've had the Democrats are a little distracted right now. Right. They would typically be the ones who would be pushing for gun control. And right now you've got some of them pushing for Joe Biden to stay in as the candidate. You've got some of them trying to push Joe Biden out as the nominee for the Democrats. So I, I think the Democrats are a little distracted. What's surprising to me is that the calls from the gun control groups have actually been fairly muted. Um, they've yeah. you know, been talking as much maybe about these ammo vending machines uh, as the need to make changes to our gun laws because uh, somebody tried to, to kill Donald Trump. Um, so I don't think that we've actually seen really any change. It's been interesting to me to see this sort of expectation on the part of the media that this would change a lot of Republican minds. I saw a Reuters piece uh, from the RNC this week where they were talking to uh, uh, to delegates and, and folks who were there at the convention. And the reporters even included in their story, I mean, it just seemed like they were surprised that nobody that they talked to said, oh, yeah, we need to ban AR-15s now. Oh, my, the skills have mm. fallen from my eyes. You know, I, I think is we are learning more about not just the individual who committed this act, but the hour uh, and maybe days that, you know, before this attack, um, the failures of security. I think that has become a, a a big topic. And I think that is probably where most of the focus is going to be. Um, this individual, you know, he used a semi-automatic rifle. He could have used a bolt action hunting rifle uh, at that distance. Might have even been, you know, more accurate. We don't know. Um, but it seems yeah, really weird to blame it on the distance. hardware when, you know, the Secret Service was not up on that roof, uh, law enforcement had not secured the perimeter of that building, even though they were inside. I was I, I'm, I'm, I'm stunned, Stephen, that nobody had a drone flying overhead to, to keep an eye on the tops of these buildings that, you know, weren't huh? secure. Um, but Apparently we also he had a drone that, and was flying it around before the event happened. Um, right. And, and that's the thing. We know that this individual thing. was identified and seen as sort of a suspicious person about an hour uh, before the shooting happened, we know that there were people who were, you know, pointing to the top of that building, telling law enforcement in the minutes before the shots were fired, yeah. hey, there's somebody up there. So I, I think that kind of like Uvalde uh, in Parkland, you know, a, a couple of other high profile shootings where there were pretty clear security failures. Um, I don't think it's wrong to say, well, first of all, I mean, I, I should note my own bias. I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to get to the point where I say yes, because somebody did a bad thing with a gun. Come take my guns away. I just don't think I'm ever going to get there. But I think there are a lot of Americans who say, well, why are we talking about this really divisive issue about banning AR-15s or raising these to purchase a firearm when there were clear security lapses, when there were things that are not policy discussions, right, but mm -hmm. but, but practical failures that we need to address uh, before we start mucking about with people's civil rights. I, I, I think that is part of what's going on. But I also think that, you know, Americans are largely dug in on this issue. Second Amendment advocates um, are not going to say, all right, come take my guns away. 
uh, because a gun was used in a violent crime. Gun control advocates are not going to say, you know what, you keep a hold of your guns um, because of, you know, a, a, a defensive gun use. We had an incredible story of bearing arms this week about a, a guy with a red flag order against him. Uh, protective order against him, broke into his ex-girlfriend's house with, a, with an axe, excuse me, burst through the door um, and was shot and killed by the woman's stepson. Um, you know, we're not going to hear anybody say I was wrong about red flag laws because of that. Right. We are sort of, I think, entrenched in our positions. And I don't know that a specific incident, no matter how profile, is really going to change a lot, except maybe at the margins, one or two percent either way.